Hi, thanks for joining us today. If this ministry has impacted your life, we want to hear about it. You can send us your story at amen at vnchurch.com. Also, we would love if you would partner with us financially. You can go to vnchurch.com and click the Give Online or text your donation amount to 757-230-2110. To honor copyright laws, we have removed some audio and video elements from this message. Now here's this week's message. guys doing this morning? Mm, I can tell you've had your coffee. Well, it is so good to see all of you here today. Uh, as you saw, we're on week number three of a series we are calling Unsung Heroes. Uh, but first, real quick, I just want to take a second. I'd like to do this and say hello to everybody watching online, uh, especially this week because I know that a lot of families, a lot of people are making a last mad dash as summer draws to a close and school's getting ready to start. I saw that on the kids' faces out there. School was getting close, and so a lot of people were running for the beach, uh, getting to the lake house or wherever. I'm just glad you made some time to get behind a computer or your phone or whatever and join us at church today. So God bless you. We love you. And uh, as I said, we're in the middle of a series we are calling Unsung Heroes. And today we're looking at heroes in the Bible. Through the series, we've been looking at heroes that we probably didn't know. You probably don't know. You've never heard of Jephthah. Most of you probably have never heard of that person. And what's interesting about these people is that they've had circumstances or life situations that would make it seem to the average person like it's impossible for them ever to be a leader, let alone a hero. So, but before we jump in, I want to take a poll. How many of you, and we're going to raise our hands, how many of you like superheroes? Okay, quite a few. Or everybody else, you're villains, and I want to see you after for prayer. Okay. <laughs> no, I'm just messing. But I think people love heroes so much because it's more than just the action-packed stuff and them saving the world. I think there's more to it. I think people rush to go see the next movie, not for all the action and stuff. I think there's something with the backstories. And what I mean by that is these heroes, these superheroes, a lot of times have a tragic past, a traumatic history that I think draws people in. Take, for example, Spider-Man. His uncle, he had just gotten his powers, and his uncle Ben is killed, and he has to watch him die right in front of him. He's only a senior in high school. Or Batman, his parents are killed when he's just a little kid. Or Superman, he, he's an infant, and his parents are blown up with his home world. Those are some pretty traumatic pasts. Yet these superheroes overcome their past, and they get those things usually launch them into their life of crime fighting and justice and world saving. And I think that people like that. I think people love to hear stories about heroes who overcome their past. So we're looking at a hero today in the Bible who had a past, a pretty traumatic past. And he had to overcome it, but it ends up being his kryptonite, which is what we'll look at today. So if you want to follow along, you can open up your Bibles or your Bible apps to Judges chapter 11. You can also follow along on your outline. We're looking at a hero named Jephthah. So we're going to jump right in at verse 1, okay? Jephthah the Gileadite was a mighty warrior. His father was Gilead. His mother was a prostitute. Gilead's wife also bore him sons. And when they were grown up, they drove Jephthah away. You are not going to get any inheritance in our family, they said, because you are the son of another woman. So Jephthah fled from his brothers and settled in the land of Tob, where a gang of scoundrels gathered around him and followed him. We can see that Jephthah had a pretty ugly past. It was not a pretty past. It was not pretty at all. Yet, he was able to kind of work through that, as we'll see. So as we walk through this scripture, as we walk through this passage, I want you to have a particular thought in your mind through our entire talk together. I want you to have a particular lens on as we look at Jephthah, and that's this. Ready? To release your past to embrace your future. You have to release your past in order to embrace your future. 
I want you to hold on to that. You see, because that's important. You have to be able to let go of some things. Why don't you look at somebody and say, we got to let go of some things. There you go. We gotta let so we gotta let go of some things. It's important. It's significant. You see, there's all kinds of things that shape who we are that go into shaping how we go through life, how we grow up, the friends we pick, the perspective we take on life, how, what job we choose, what school we go through. There's a lot of things that go into shaping that. But one of the greatest things that shapes who you are is your past. There's nothing like it. It shapes who you are. See, and I think that's why Eleanor Roosevelt once said that the future doesn't belong to people who get sidetracked by their past or people who get troubled by people. No, she said that the future belongs to those that believe in the beauty of their dream. And that's important. I think people a lot of times get caught up with letting their past eclipse their present and their future. They let the pains and the troubles in their past take a, rob them of the present and of their future. See, when people hold on so tight to the past, they miss what God is doing right here. And they miss what God has for them. They miss God's present, what he's trying to do right now in your life and what he's trying to do in your future. Well, Jephthah, as we saw, had an ugly past. And that's, it's an important to understand how your past operates in your life. And so I have three things I want to share with you, and they're huge. The first one is your past does not determine your destiny. Amen. Your past does not determine your destiny. Your past may have affected you. It may have impacted you. And this is important. It may have impacted you, but it doesn't have to define who you are. And it doesn't have to determine your future. It doesn't. You see, Jephthah, he was the son of a distinguished man, a man named Gilead. And that man, Gilead, visited a prostitute in a moment of weakness, went and visited a prostitute. And because of that illicit relationship, Jephthah was born. Jephthah's story started. Well, I want you to see that because Jephthah, I want you to see the pain in Jephthah's life in his past, because it's important, because his brothers end up kicking him out, kicking him away, sending him away, get out of here, and they did it for a couple reasons, and I want to go through those. The first one is that he was a disturbing reminder. See, and remember, your past does not determine your destiny, so that's why we're going to talk about how his past tried to determine his destiny, but he doesn't let it. The first one is a disturbing reminder. You see, Jephthah, when he walked around the house, when he sat at the dinner table, to his brothers, he was a reminder of their father's mistakes. They, they would look at him and they say, Dad, what the heck? They wouldn't see Jephthah for who he was. They'd see their dad's mistakes. And see, that's important because in life, people will mishandle you emotionally. People will hurt you. And it's nothing you did. It's simply because you remind them of something in their past. So you have to recognize that. It's hard, but it's important. The second thing is, he was, scholars suggest he was a different race. And see, prostitution was outside of the Mosaic law, so the prostitute, his mother would have been of a different cultural background, a different ethnic milieu, a different race, if you will. And so not only was he a disturbing reminder now, but he had to walk around the house looking different from his brothers. See, people will mishandle you just because they don't get you, just because you don't look like them. And see, that's one of the things I love about Vineyard Church. One of the top things is because we're extra intentional about bringing all of us together. We're extra intentional about bringing everybody into the body of Christ. You see, it doesn't matter about your race, what you look like, your socioeconomic status, your gender. None of that matters. We're all children of God. See, but that's not how it is in the world. You see in the news, that's not how it is. People today are still not judged on the content of their character, but on the color of their skin. Still to this day. So he's a disturbing reminder. He looked differently. And he was a dreadful representation. His brothers feared that he would be a dreadful representation of their family. See, Jephthah was the oldest. He was supposed to be the next judge of Israel. The leadership of the family fell on him. But his brothers were afraid that he would not represent what they stood for. He was a disturbing reminder. He looked differently. He was a dreadful representation. And lastly, he was a disastrous replica. They looked at Jephthah and they would say, well, if we let you lead us, how are you going to be different from dad? How are you going to be different from dad? See, people are going to abuse you. They're going to hurt you. They're going to make decisions that affect you, and it's not your fault. It's not. See, this is where generational sin sneaks in. The enemy likes to whisper a lie that because you were in the line of somebody who set a bad example, you have to live by that same example. Because your parents 
because you had a parent who was an alcoholic, you too have to be an alcoholic. Because your parents got divorced, you, your marriage too has to end in divorce. But that's a lie. The truth is you do not have to live by that same example. You can set a different example. And that's so important. You see, there's a part of this story that is so important. And that's probably because what I just said, I feel God telling me it's ringing with some of you, that none of this was Jephthah's fault. All those things I just listed, none of it was. Now, in our past, there are some things that are our fault. We live by the consequences of our decisions sometimes. But so, there's some, I feel God tell me, there's some things in your past that are not your fault. I don't care how painful it was, how, how you can't forget it, it wasn't your fault. See, to get past those things that aren't your fault, you have to change the narrative. You have to change the question from whose fault is it to how can God get the glory? And that's hard. It is hard to change that narrative, but it's the key to, the, the key to being released from your past. See, it reminds me of a story in John chapter 9 when Jesus is walking with his disciples, and they see a blind man. And the disciples ask Jesus, uh, why is that man blind? Uh, did he do something wrong? Is it his sin? Is it his father's sin? Is it his mother's sin? And Jesus looks at them and he says, no, no, no. It's nobody's sin, nobody's fault. This happened so that God may get the glory. So, you need to hear this. God sometimes, it's crazy, but he acts in the most unusual ways. What seems like a messed up situation is a lot of times the perfect situation for God to act. And when he acts, he acts in powerful ways. So your past does not determine your destiny. And second, people can't deter you from your destiny. People can't deter you from your destiny. You need to hear this. Negative, difficult people, when they're in your life, no matter how difficult they are, they can't stop what God has for you. They can't disrupt his plan for you. I don't know about you, but I have some difficult people in my life. I don't know, maybe they just live on my street. I don't know <laughs> about that. Seems like a lot of them live there. But it comforts me to know that no matter how bad their grief gets, no matter how difficult they are, they can't stop what God has for me. They cannot get in the way. They cannot disrupt what God has in store for me. See, Jephthah's brothers sent him away sent Jephthah away because they wanted to destroy his destiny. They didn't want to just get Jephthah out of there. They wanted to break his destiny. They wanted to break him. But what his brothers planned to break him, God used to bless him. It's powerful. What the enemy tries to use for bad, God always flips upside down and uses for our good. It's powerful. So he blessed him in three ways. I want to run through these. These are people can't deter you from your destiny. So how did God bless him? He blessed him personally when he went to the land of Tob. Can somebody say Tob? Tob. Tob. It's a weird name. <laughs> well, Tob, he went to the land of Tob and God blessed him personally. And that was because Jephthah, as I said, was, he was the oldest. He was supposed to be the next judge of Israel, but he wasn't pursuing God's purpose for his life. And that was because he placed his identity, his destiny, his future in his brothers. He was so enamored, so consumed with earning their love and acceptance that he was willing to give up God's big plan for his life. So God had to move him out of that place. He recognized his identity wasn't in him. See, sometimes God, the biggest thing God will do for us is he'll move some things, move some situations, some circumstances, even people. And this is important. I want to say this because God might be moving people in your life right now. And sometimes it's hard to see because it's painful. It's painful when people leave, especially if they've been there for a couple seasons. But God moves those people sometimes because, because he recognizes you're giving your identity to them. You're looking for approval in them. And if you put your identity in people, they will drop the ball 100% of the time. It's not if, it's when. Mm -hmm. See, and God, God loves you too daggone much to let you do that. So if you're putting too much, too much equity into people, God's going to move those people so you'll focus more on him. He wants your attention but because he loves you. He loves you too much to let your identity ride on the shoulders of other people. He wants it to be in him. So God rearranged some people, moved Jephthah around. He also blessed him relationally. He put him in a place, I think this is interesting, he put Jephthah in a place where there were scoundrels. You know, we read that uh, other translations say that, that they were uh, a band of wild men, some wildlings running around. And, you know, it's... it's Tob was the Alcatraz of the day. It was a prison colony. There were murderers, thieves, uh, crooks, just a lot of bad people there. But these people, for whatever reason, looked up to Jephthah, and they started following him. 
you know, I like to think it's because their life situations, kind of the things we listed, are not that different from Jephthah. Their parental situation was probably not that different. Nevertheless, they looked up to Jephthah, and they started following him. Jephthah got married in Tob. He had a kid in Tob. God started blessing him relationally. It's crazy how God blesses you in the least expected places. God will meet you in your Tob. And you see, I think that's important that Jephthah was connecting with these people, and he was leading them, and he was doing some change. Because a lot of times we get caught up with not connecting with people who have our same God-given purpose, but who are our same type. And a lot of times that's not the same. You know, I, I might be short, white, and handsome, and that's my type. <laughs> <laughs> but that night, those people might not be with my God-given purpose. I have to make an extra effort, even if it might be hard, to connect with people who not be, might not be my type, might not look like me, but are on the same path as me, are here to achieve the God-given purpose we've been given. And that's hard, but we have to work extra hard for that. And God will give you those opportunities. The last thing is he blessed them providentially. You see, what the enemy used, as I said, what the enemy wanted to use for evil, God providentially blessed him. He providentially blessed him. See, get this. Tob in Hebrew is actually, literally means good. So when the Bible says that he settled in the land of Tob, it says he settled in the land of good. Do you see? When it says, another translation says he went to a place called Tob, his brother sent him to a place called Tob, the, the scripture saying that he was sent to a place called good. Do you get it? See, what seems like a messed up situation on the surface, what doesn't make sense to us, it, it, it seems like nothing good can come out of it. God has a plan underneath the surface. He has a plan for good. He has a purpose on your life. He knows where he t he's taking you, and he knows where he wants you to go. See, God will put you in that unattractive place, that tobe, because he knows that's where you'll grow. See, Jephthah would have never been a leader, would have never been a hero if he didn't go to tobe, if he didn't go to that good place. And the same is true for you. God wants to put you in a place where the leader, the hero in you will be birthed out of. He wants to put you in your good place. He wants you there. And you have to trust him with that. So your past does not determine your destiny. People can't deter you from your destiny. And lastly, this one's a big one because this catches a lot of people. A failure to let go of your past will destroy your destiny. Failure to let go of your past will destroy your destiny. Now, it's interesting. Jephthah's doing pretty well in Tob. We've seen that. He got blessed. He has a family. He has a kid. He's, he's a leader. He's a hero in Tob. He's doing well. But then who shows up? His brothers. They come roaring back into his life, and they bring all that pain of the past with them, everything they represent. And they didn't come back to apologize. Hey, Jephthah, we're sorry. They didn't come back to congratulate. Hey, you're doing a great job out here. They, they didn't come to do that. They became because they wanted something from him. So you be careful. Be very careful. When people come into your life not for who you are, but for what they can get from you, be careful. It could be a trap. So they came back because they wanted him to lead them. They wanted him to be their commander. Let's look in verse 4. Sometime later when the Ammonites were fighting against Israel, the elders of Gilead went to get Jephthah from the land of Tob. Come, they said. Be our commander so we can fight the Ammonites. And I think this is key. I want to highlight this because whether or not you trust God and where he's leading you, whether or not you trust the people God has placed in your life and around you is really shown when people from your past come back in. How you handle from your people from your past says a lot about how you trust God now. And as we see, Jephthah did not handle him very well. Jephthah's in a conundrum now. He's being pulled back to the past. You can see that. Verse 7, Jephthah said to them, Didn't you hate me and drive me from my father's house? Why do you come to me now when you're in trouble? The elders of Gilead said to him, Nevertheless, we are turning to you now. Come with us to fight the Ammonites, and you will be head over all of us who live in Gilead. Jephthah answered, Suppose you take me back to fight the Ammonites, and the Lord gives them to me. Will I really be your head? The elders of Gilead replied, The Lord is our witness. We will certainly do as you say. See, Jephthah's getting cocky now. <laughs> but he's getting pulled back into the past. He's so consumed with getting the approval of his brothers and being leader over them 
that he's willing to give up what he already has. He's willing to give up what God had given him just for the approval and the respect and the love of his brothers. He's like, wait a minute, th- th- you, you didn't even like me a few months ago, a few lines ago, you didn't like me. And they're like, no, no, don't worry about that. We'll make you leader right now. You'll be commander over us right now. And Jephthah goes with them. He lets the past suck him back in. And it consumes every area, all of his decision making, consumes him so bad that he ends up making a rash vow to God. Pick up at verse 30, we're going to jump down. And Jephthah made a vow to the Lord, if you give the Ammonites into my hands, whatever comes out of the door of my house to meet me when I return in triumph from the Ammonites will be the Lord's and I will sacrifice it as a burnt offering. Uh, what? That's a bad call. <laughs> you can already see where this is going. See, but he wanted the approval of the wrong people so bad he was willing to sacrifice the right people. He wanted the approval of the wrong people so bad. Well, guess who comes out of this house? Jump down to verse 34. So he's victorious in battle. When Jephthah returned to his home in Mizpah, who should come out to meet him but his daughter, dancing to the sounds of timbrels? She was an only child, except for her, he had neither son nor daughter. His vow was that aimed at impressing the wrong people. He wanted the wrong people to like him so bad he was going to give up the right people. See, and at this point, he's still not in a dilemma. He has a choice to make. He has a choice. You see, Jephthah was a Jew, and in that they would study the law all the time, and Jephthah would have known this. Let's look in Deuteronomy 12, 29. The Lord your God will cut off before you the nations you are about to invade and dispossess. But when you have driven them out and settled in their land, and after they have been destroyed before you, be careful not to be ensnared by inquiring about their gods, saying, how do these nations serve their gods? We will do the same. You must not worship the Lord your God in their way, because in worshiping their gods, they do all kinds of detestable things the Lord hates. They even burn their sons and daughters in the fire as sacrifices to their gods. See, God did not want human sacrifices. That's not what he wanted. So Jephthah thinks he's in this dilemma, but he's not. He's not in a dilemma between keeping his promise however rashly made, and upholding the law not to burn people. He's not caught there. Look, the Bible gives a way out of a vow. Look at this in Leviticus 27. The Lord said to Moses, Speak to the Israelites and say to them, If anyone makes a special vow to dedicate a person to the Lord by giving the equivalent value. See, and in this verse they're talking about a vow of a Nazarite vow. Like uh, the prophet Samuel, he was dedicated to serve in the temple of the Lord all his life if his mother Hannah was able to have him as a child. And so there was a way, sometimes people rashly made that vow. When it came time to give baby Samuel up, they couldn't do it. So there was a way to get out of that vow. So Jephthah was surely not caught in between these two things. And it's important to see that some vows are meant to be broken, but some vows are not meant to be broken. For instance, marital vows, those are vows that are not meant to be broken. But vows that do something that God prohibits, that he doesn't want, those should be broken always. A vow to lie for somebody. You promise to lie for somebody. You promise you're going to live with your girlfriend before you get married. You promise you're going to help out with this crime. Those are vows that should always be broken and should never have been made in the first place. See, Jephthah was so consumed with people his brother's people and his brothers and earning their love and respect and approval that it took him to the edge. It took him to the precipice of sacrificing the wrong, the right people for the wrong people. But I want to tell you that nobody else has to die. What, what do I mean? Nobody else has to die. Nobody else has to be sacrificed because Jesus died for us. He died so nobody else should have to be sacrificed. Your family doesn't have to be sacrificed. Your children don't have to be sacrificed. Your marriage doesn't have to be sacrificed. Your hopes, your dreams, your future, the things God has placed inside of you, you don't have to give that up. You see, the, Je- the story with Jephthah does not end well. Jephthah ends up sacrificing his daughter. He ends up sacrificing his only daughter. His daughter was his future. Children, they 
represents future, a better tomorrow, more days to come. And he sacrificed that for the wrong people. You don't have to make that same mistake. God loves you too daggone much to let you make that same mistake. Would you bow your heads with me? You know, this is one of those stories that doesn't get talked about a lot. Doesn't get talked about in church a lot. You don't hear Sunday school lessons on Jephthah. You don't go to conferences on Jephthah. (laughs) But when I studied this passage and I tried to understand what God wanted me to say, I was actually going to go in a completely different direction. But God pointed me in this direction. And I have a suspicion that he had me say these things for a reason. He wanted somebody to hear it. He wanted to poke that person in that sensitive area. He has so much more in store for you. He doesn't want you to be held hostage by your past. That's not what God wants. He wants you to release your past and embrace his future for you. Well, the first step to doing that is giving your life to Jesus. I like to describe salvation in one word, and that's surrender. You have to be willing to surrender your past. You have to be willing to surrender your past to Jesus in order to embrace his future. See, God isn't looking for perfect. He's looking for surrender. And I've got some great news for you. Getting near God will be the simplest thing you've ever done in your life. But it will cost you everything so worth it. It's so worth it. All you have to do is surrender the control of your life, and he makes everything new. You get a fresh start. Some of you need that today. Some of you have never given your life to Jesus, and you don't have to join this church. You just have to give control of your life to Jesus. You have to surrender. And if that is you, I want to lead every one of you through this prayer. So would you pray with me? God, thank you for sending your son to pay for what I did. I receive the forgiveness of my sin. Now say this to God. I surrender my life completely. I give you my life. I want to know you. I want to serve you. Be my God, my Savior, my friend. I confess Jesus as Lord. I believe he was died, was buried, and rose again. And I surrender my life to him. In your name I pray. Thanks for listening to this week's message. We hope you enjoyed it. Don't hesitate to write us your story at amen at and we'll see you next week.